Good evening, and thank you for the invitation from the Charisma Foundation for this uh, web conference. Um, I am here, I'm Michael Carroll, and I am a professor of law at American University in Washington, D.C., and I am here to speak a little bit about copyright limitations and exceptions, um, and the empowering role that they play in promoting a just civil society. So first, uh, I, we need to speak a little bit about the rights of the author and the role of author's rights or copyright in society, then to understand the role of the limits and the exceptions to the author's rights as part of a broader social policy. Um, I have in my hands the uh, English translation from the World Intellectual Property Organization of the Colombian uh, copyright law. And when you look at it, it looks very typical of a copyright law. Uh, the, the assumption in copyright law is that authors are members of society who provide some special benefit to the society through their creative works, which embody their personality and which uh, enrich our lives with new stories, with new knowledge, with new entertainment, um, and uh, that this contribution to society uh, needs to be rewarded through the recognition of copyright or author's rights, which is comprised of both some moral rights, the right to be given credit as the author, the right um, to uh, control certain uses of the, the work based on the personality interests of the author, and then some economic rights to economically profit and benefit from uh, the contribution to society. Um, most of what we will be speaking about re uh, focuses on the limits and the exceptions to the economic rights that are given to the author. So um, the author, the theory is that we need to give these control to the author because without the control, uh, other members of society would freely copy the work of the author without giving the author credit, without paying the author, and the author would then uh, not have enough of an incentive or a, a desire to provide the creative works to society. So the exclusive rights under the author's rights are there to require permission, to require payment for use of the work. And uh, this is the basic understanding of author's rights, is that um, the author can control the making of copies of the uh, creative work, the distribution of the copies to the public, the public performance of any kind of uh, literary or other works that can be performed, the communication to the public of the uh, copyrighted work, the public display of the copyrighted work, the public uh, or the creation of adaptations, including the right of translation, um, or the right to change a, a novel into a movie, into a television show. Those are all the typical rights given to the author uh, where permission is required. And the general structure of the author's right is to, to, to define the rights very broadly uh, without taking account of any particular situation and just say, if you want to make a copy, if you want to perform, go get permission. The role of the limitations and the exceptions is then usually understood as uh, particular kinds of uses where the author should not have control, where the author should permit the use because there is some public benefit to the use that the law should recognize. And so we have a balance between this special treatment of the author through the author's rights and then a general recognition of the rights of society to use the contribution of the author in education, entertainment, news and criticism, other kinds of socially beneficial uses. And what we want to talk about today a little bit is understanding the, the way the limitations and exceptions are usually talked about in copyright law, copyright policy. And then to talk a little bit about the positive agenda and the desire to re-understand, to change the framing of how the limitations and exceptions are understood in order to then un to talk about what kinds of limitations and exceptions should a good copyright law have. 
So the, if you listen to the language, we have the author's rights, and then we have the limitations and exceptions. So the public merely gets little limits or exceptions, but otherwise the author gets the rights. And so this understanding privileges the author against the user, um, and the, the author's interest is considered more important than the user. And when you look at the um, particular limits and exceptions in the law, you see that the general rights of the author are very broadly understood, very broadly defined, and then the limits and the exceptions are often very, very specific. Um, a general limit that all copyright laws that uh, are part of the international system have to have is the right to quote. So a small quotation from another uh, source, as long as the source is identified, is considered um, a mandatory limitation and exception in the Berne Convention, um, which is from the, the late 19th century. But this is a typical use where, uh, if you think about it, should, isn't it so natural that a person should want to quote something they heard from another person? This is a normal part of human discourse. But in the structure of author's rights, that normal activity has to be treated as a special exception because the right to reproduce the work, the right to perform the work, is defined so broadly that if you don't create an exception for even that very normal activity of quoting someone else, uh, there is no legal basis for being allowed to do it. This is the problem or the tension in the structure of copyright law, is that normal activities have to be covered by exceptions or limitations rather than being treated as normal uh, under the law. Um, and so one of the things that civil society needs to do, especially in the digital age, is to think about those activities which users consider to be normal, that society should consider to be normal, but that the copyright law does not deal with. Because if the copyright law does not create an exception or a limitation, the assumption is the use of the author's work is infringing and is, is, uh, creates legal liability. So the exceptions and the limitations create the space, the enabling or the empowering ability to engage in activities with cultural works provided by others. So if we look at the Colombian law and you look to um, the different articles of, the, of this law, and I, I have it in front of me, you can see that um, in, in chapter two, there are a series of limitations and exceptions that are very, um, very, very specific. Uh, if I can give you an example, um, Article 39 of the law says, it shall be permissible to reproduce by painting, drawing, photography, or cinematography, works that are permanently located on public highways, streets, or squares, and to distribute such reproductions or works and communicate them to the public. With regard to works of architecture, this provision shall be applicable solely to outward views. So if you look at that provision, it's doing two things. It's articulating what type of work is subject to the limitation or the exception. And then it's saying which of the exclusive rights of the author is being limited by that provision. And it is the job of the limitation and exception to define the work or the type of work that is being allowed to be used and then to define which of the activities covered by the exclusive rights are being permitted. And the presumption again is if that limitation or exception does not cover the activity or does not cover the type of work, then the right belongs to the author and permission must be uh, received from the author. So as you go down the list of, of uh, the Colombian uh, law of author's rights, there are many articles, and you might think, well, this is a very liberal law. It, it creates lots of freedom. I mean, if we count, we can, we can count um, 
from Article 31 all the way to Article 44, there are many limitations and exceptions. But each of these is very limited to different types of works, different types of uses, or different places. Let me give you one other. Article 44. The use of scientific, literary, and artistic works in a private residence without gainful intent shall be free. So you are permitted to read an article in your own home. And again, the law gives you that permission as a special exception to the author's right. Otherwise, the idea would be that reading in your own home might be copyright infringement. This is a very broad understanding of the author's rights to control the work of authorship. And I, if you look at the um, Washington Declaration and the positive agenda on intellectual property in the public interest, the, the people who wrote and signed that declaration have a different understanding of the author's relationship to society. And the positive agenda suggests that civil society needs to demand more limitations and exceptions on the author's rights because these are actually not just limits on the author but empowering or enabling provisions that recognize the human rights of other members of society or the positive contribution that other members of society can make when they use other people's works of authorship. So as the, the list, I could read you the rest of the list of what is permitted um, by the Colombian law currently, but I would suggest to you that when you look at the limitations and exceptions around the world, there are many pieces that are missing. Um, and certain topics are covered by the limitations and exceptions, but what is allowed is very limited. So uses of some works in the educational setting is permitted, but does not cover all of the normal things that teachers want to do in classrooms and is even more difficult if it is used as part of distance education. So uh, when we think about limitations and exceptions, we can think about those uses that ought to be permitted in the normal offline world. And then even more importantly, what is normal in the digital world? What should be allowed in the digital world? And there is a lot of work to be done in promoting more limitations and exceptions to empower digital uses. Making fun of a copyrighted work in a YouTube video, using a popular song in a home movie where you are uh, taking a, a picture of your child dancing around to the music, you are using the author's musical work, but you are mostly telling a story about family life and watching your cute child dance to the music. Should the author be able to control your use of the copyrighted work when you want to show your family and friends your child dancing around to a popular song? Most civil society activists would say, no, that of course is normal, it should be permitted. But as I discussed, the, the structure of the author's right says, no, 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 any use of the author's work requires the author's permission, even if you're using it it, for the purpose of communicating with your family and friends um, over a social network. And so there's a lot of work to be done on, on the creation of the limitations and exceptions. Now, let, if we think about the approach, the, the law has two kinds of groups. Some limitations and exceptions permit the use without any compensation to the author. Some of those uses require recognition of the moral right. So perhaps you have to use the author's name when you use the work. Or if the author demands that you not use the author's name, you have to respect that. So it is possible to qualify the conditions of the use. But in this group of limitations and exceptions, the use is permitted without the author's permission and without payment to the author. There is another group of uses that can be uh, where the author's work is so valuable to the use that it seems only fair that the author be given compensation for the use, but not control. This is sometimes uh, referred to as uh, equitable remuneration. 
That is, uh, if you're translating an entire work that is already published in Spanish, and maybe you're translating it into a local dialect, and the publisher does not want to publish into that language, should you have to pay for the right to translate? Well, maybe yes, because you're using the entire work. But um, if the author is not going to use translate the work, uh, maybe you should have a right to do it. And in fact, the Colombian copyright law has an extensive provision about when it is okay to translate without the author's permission as an example of a beneficial use to society um, where we might take compensation and control and separate them. For the remainder of my talk here, I want to focus on that first group of limitations and exceptions. What are the kinds of things people ought to be able to do for free without having the author's permission? And we can think about um, a, a series of activities that ought to be permitted and then look at the Colombian law and say, are these activities currently permitted? If so, are they defined broadly enough to really permit the activity even in a digital space. So a typical one is in addition to the right to quote, quote people is to make fun, parody, satire. Is it permitted to use the copyrighted work in order to make fun of the copyrighted work? Many systems permit this, but many other systems do not because it is not specifically permitted. This seems like a very typical use that ought to be permitted as a matter of freedom of expression and ought to be permitted uh, not just in your own home, but in a YouTube video or in some kind of social media uh, in, in the public digital space. And it is the kind of use that the author would not normally give permission for, but it makes society and the culture richer and that is the kind of use that limitations and exceptions are there to enable and to empower. In addition, other kinds of news reporting, criticism, commentary um, are typical subjects for limitations and exceptions. The Colombian law does have some permissions for the use of news articles and other um, uh, kinds of activities, but these should be examined to see if they meet your idea of what is normal and fair in terms of using the news of the day in, in classrooms or in discussion groups or other kinds of public spaces. In addition, there are two other um, big areas. One is the educational use. When should a teacher or a university or a school have to pay a license fee, pay permission, um, to make a copy of a work for an educational purpose? Must it always be a licensed work or may it sometimes be permitted to make the copy for free? Um, and many systems have an educational use that is um, a part of their law. Uh, in addition for research uh, activities, the Article 44, which I read to you, suggests that the scientific article can only be used in the private residence. Does that mean the professor in the office may not use the article without permission? It suggests the answer is yes. Is that really what fair practice uh, would allow? Is it really necessary if the university has purchased the article, um, uh, purchased a copy of a journal, to not permit the uh, author from making a copy for himself in his office. This is the kind of thing where um, these very particular limitations and exceptions do not have the flexibility to adapt to new circumstances. May the author use some, I'm sorry, may the professor use some of the article on a website the author puts up on the internet. Well, again, that is not the kind of use that the limitations and exceptions are, have been focused on, and so the answer would often be no. Do you agree that that should be the answer? What about digitizing older works? May a library make digital copies of out-of-print works and put them up on the internet? 
These are the kinds of activities that should be enabled, that should be empowered by limitations and exceptions, but they are missing from the list. And if the activity is not on the list, it is considered to be infringing. So it is very important for civil society to step forward with a positive vision of the kinds of uses of creative works, educational works, that should be permitted for free while recognizing the contribution the author makes to society. So um, in addition to criticism, commentary, educational use, research use, um, and, and other kinds of mashup culture, what about uh, using small snippets of songs and putting them together in a new song? Is that the kind of activity that should require payment and permission, or is that part of digital culture, part of using the digital tools to use cultural objects around one to create from uh, these works. This is an active part of the conversation. The old style of author's rights generally answers that that kind of activity is not permitted, but digital uh, people using digital technology feel that it is such a natural way of creating from other creative works. Should it always require permission and payment, or shouldn't there be some space for freedom to use creative works to create new creative works, where only small pieces are being used and put together into a new creative work? This is, this is the kind of activity the positive agenda wants to see enabled, empowered, permitted, but it requires civil society to stand up and say the author's rights need to be respected, but the author's rights are not the only rights that count. Society has an interest in the culture. Society has an interest in access to the culture, in participation in the culture, and that sometimes requires using the author's work to participate in culture. That is what the positive agenda seeks. We seek uh, limitations and exceptions that enable that. So here then um, are two important strategies that I, I want to leave you with. The first is to uh, make the case in the courts for the broadest interpretation that is reasonable of the existing law, such as the quotation right. What counts as a quotation? Is it only using text? Can you take a photograph of another photograph and that might be a quotation or is that just a copy? Second, it is not enough to try to make the list bigger. It might be desirable to think of other activities that belong on the list of limitations and exceptions, but our imagination is limited by what we know and the future holds many interesting new opportunities for participation and creation of culture. What is needed is a flexible limitation and exception that is not confined in the way that I had suggested earlier to a particular kind of work or a particular exclusive right. Instead, a balancing provision that generally asks, what is the benefit of the use that is being made? What is the effect on the author's interests? And does the balance favor the use or not? That kind of limitation and exception, which we have in the US copyright law as fair use, allows the courts to make a more specific determination based on new circumstances. In the digital age where new technologies continue to get developed, where things like temporary copies, which no one thought about before, suddenly could technically be copies the author controls. This is the kind of technological use that you cannot um, address with a closed list. Instead, the flexible open provision allows the court to look at the particular new technology, look at the author's interest and the society's interest to make a fair determination about whether control or compensation is required for the author. In many cases, these technical infringements will be determined to be 
free of any copyright control because they benefit the public without harming the author. And this kind of flexibility allows the law to adapt and grow with the new environment, with the new technology. So of all the different things that civil society could do to make the law work better for the society, it is to push for a single flexible um, limitation and exception that is not limited to the type of copyrighted work and is not limited by which kind of exclusive right but instead balances the general interests of the author and the general interests of society in the use. So I, I, I believe my role here is to inform and to encourage, and I sincerely want to encourage the, the pushing for an open, flexible limitation and exception. This could be a very big difference in what is permitted and not in the internet. Educational uses, research uses, cultural conversation, all of these things can be enabled by an open or a, a balancing provision rather than having to go case by case. And of course you can do both. You, there, you can add to the list if there are particular activities with particular works that should be permitted right now. But please don't stop at the closed list. Opening up the list is the critical provision and we see countries around the world make, making this move. The country of Israel changed its uh, copyright law and it adopted a fair use provision in, in order to create the flexibility. South Korea entered into a free trade agreement very much like the free trade agreement the US made with uh, Colombia and that after entering into the free trade agreement South Korea changed its copyright law and as part of that change they adopted an open provision that combines the so-called three-step test with fair use. Um, so many other countries are looking at some kind of opening clause. Brazil is currently looking at a law that would have some kind of opening clause. China is looking at a, a revision of its law that might have an opening clause. This is the new trend in the world and it is an important trend because it recognizes society needs to have its interests taken into account when we balance between the author and society's rights. Now I mentioned this thing three-step test so I want to finish with this um, point about international copyright law. Colombia and many other countries in the world are members of international agreements. The member, each country that signs the agreement makes certain promises about what their copyright law will and will not do. The so-called three-step test is a promise at the international level to create some boundaries around the kinds of limitations and exceptions to the author's rights that will be permissible. There are some myths about what the three-step test does and does not say. In general, it, it limits the legislator to uh, creating limitations and exceptions that apply in special cases that do not harm the normal exploitation of the work and do not prejudice the legitimate interests of the copyright owner or the author. Um, but there are a lot of mistaken interpretations about what that does and does not permit. For example, what is a special case? Some people argue that only if you particularly say this type of work, this exclusive right, do you have a special case. But some lead, lead authorities about the international system have written a paper for us that is very explicit that the kind of balancing provision, the open provision, in fact is better at getting at special cases because it is only a special case when the balance favors the use. So you look at the very particularities of the kind of use and then determine whether it is permitted or not. That is a special case. So there is no problem with an opening clause under the three-step test about special cases. What about normal exploitation? 
that also is considered as part of the opening clause, the balancing provision, and that will be one of the factors in deciding whether the use should be permitted or not. We have to recognize that the normal uh, economic exploitation of the work where there is existing licensing practices has to be taken into account when we decide whether a use should be permitted or not. And we have to take account of the legitimate interests of the author in having their name and reputation recognized and protected. However, we also have to remember that society has rights and international human rights is part of the international system. The freedom of expression is part of the in in international system. And so whether it is part of the author's rights specifically or part of the general international framework, uh, society's rights also have to be recognized when we consider how the three-step test applies. And when you take this perspective, it is easy to see that uh, national law has lots of room, plenty of room, for a balanced, flexible limitation and exception as a way to enable those uses of copyrighted works that allow for education, allow for mashup culture, remix culture, research, the news reporting, the kinds of beneficial activities that we really want in a rich culture. So those are the types of activities that should be fought for as part of the uh, positive agenda. The general way to fight for that inside the author's rights tradition is to define limitations and exceptions. While it is easy enough to do more specific limitations and exceptions, the best way to achieve better balance, but more rights for society is through an open-ended um, balancing provision that takes account of the author's right, but also takes account of the society's interest. I would love to enter into a discussion with you now about more specific ways in which this kind of advocacy can be uh, done. But the final points are more limitations and exceptions are perfectly acceptable under international law. More limitations and exceptions are necessary to make the author's rights fit with the modern situation of digital technology, of access to culture and that it takes civil society to make the author's rights law come into line with the modern situation. So I encourage you for the work ahead. I, I hope that you have found this useful and I look forward to more conversation about the positive agenda. Thank you.